السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته صباح الخير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I'll present my way in selecting the best option in refractive surgery Actually I follow five component checklist I check the refractive error I measure the mesopic pupil I take into consideration the K readings of the patient uh, I calculate the PTA or percent tissue altered and I consider pupil offset in some uh, cases uh, starting with the refractive error. Um, I follow this uh, flow chart uh, when I want to select the best option for the patient. Uh, if I have, for example, if I have uh, less than minus five diopters, I have, uh, I go for keratorefractive procedures. Uh, of course, I'm, uh, let me uh, uh, say that um, um, if the topography is very, very good, I'm not going now to discuss the topography uh, aspect. Uh, suppose the topography is very good, and now I have all these options. So when the refractive error is uh, small, uh, I go for uh, uh, LASIK or PRK, um, or let me say superficial, uh, or surface, sorry, su surface ablation or lamellar ablation. Uh, when it is in, uh, moderate, I have an, uh, an additional option like the fake KIOL, but when it is high, I uh, don't do uh, keratorefractive procedures. Um, and uh, when the patient has plus, um, my limit uh, for keratorefractive procedure is uh, plus four. Uh, otherwise, I go for fake KIOL or um, uh, refractive lens exchange or what we call clear lens extraction. And in mixed astigmatism, I may do uh, LASIK. Actually, uh, there are uh, 12 don'ts. Uh, they were 10, but uh, today in the morning, I developed them to, to another uh, ones because I learned from Arthur and Ala yesterday a lot of things. Uh, actually, I don't do LASIK uh, when the uh, thickness uh, of the cornea is below 500 microns and when the PTA is above four, uh, 40%. percent. Um, uh, I don't do surface ablation when the corneal thickness is less than 470 and when the final thickness after ablation with epithelium uh, is less than 400 microns. Uh, I don't uh, reduce the optical zone in any circumstance um, below the 6 millimeter when the patient is myopic and I don't reduce it below 7 millimeters uh, when the patient is hyperopic. Uh, for the fake KIOL, uh, I take into consideration the anterior chamber depth and anterior chamber angle uh, and the age of the patient and uh, the endothelial cell count. And uh, for the refractive lens exchange, I don't do it when the patient is younger than uh, 40, um, except in very extreme cases. Uh, what I added is the uh, the OSI, I learned from uh, Dr. Ala and Dr. Arthur yesterday that the um, scatter index is very important in selection, especially if I want to go for fake KIOLs or for LASIK surface ablation in late 30s, early 40s. Uh, so maybe the patient may have uh, early cataract and um, this will give us a very good uh, indication. Um, after that, uh, I measure the uh, mesopic pupil. The mesopic pupil is measured, the, be the best way to measure mesopic pupil is the pupillometer. It is a special device to measure the pupil. It is the, the best device. Otherwise, if we don't have it, we can depend on uh, the topographers like Cyrus, Pentacam, and uh, Galilei. Uh, however, um, it is not that much accurate. And uh, it is very important to select the optical zone because I roughly add 0 0.5 millimeter to the mesopic pupil to select the optical zone or I multiply it by 1.1. The K readings are very important uh, in the calculation before proceeding. Uh, K1, which is the flat K, is uh, important for myopic ablation, and uh, K max, maximum K reading, is very important in hyperopic ablation, and uh, I uh, measure the astigmatism depending on the uh, total corneal refractive power map uh, using the uh, five millimeter zone centered with the pupil center. Uh, why I uh, should see the K readings? Because, as you know, uh, each one diopter of myopic ablation 
uh, reduces the flat K by 0 0.8, and we should never go beyond uh, three, uh, 34 diopters, below 34 diopters. Uh, on the other hand, in hyperopic ablation, each plus one uh, diopter increases roughly the K max, not the K2, steep K, the K max. We should look at the K max by 1.25 diopters almost, and we should never go uh, beyond the 49. I mean, um, uh, we have to calculate the K reading, how they will be after the operation, and if they are more than 49, we, should, we shouldn't do the uh, operation. The patient tissue uh, altered uh, is uh, a very, very uh, important, um, uh, let's say, uh, index uh, to avoid ectasia, and it is more important than the residual stromal bed uh, uh, issue. We have to stop using the residual stromal bed issue. We have to depend on the PTA. The PTA is calculated as follows. Uh, it is the ratio uh, of uh, flap thickness added to ablation depth um, uh, divided by the uh, central corneal thickness and multiplied by one, 100. Uh, the uh, central corneal depth can be uh, seen by the Peaky Apex on the Pentacam. Um, and uh, for the ablation depth, there are two methods to calculate it in your clinic. Uh, either on site by the machine itself, by the uh, eczema uh, laser, uh, or you can do it manually. Uh, on the eczema machine, you can put uh, the refractive error you want to uh, treat and the optical zone that you have selected, and it will calculate for you the ablation depth. Uh, otherwise, if you don't have <coughs> right now an access in your clinic, an access to the eczema machine, you can depend on the monoline formula uh, or roughly each one diopter of myopic ablation ablates uh, 13 microns for 6 millimeter optical zone, 15 microns for 6.5 millimeter optical zone, and 17 microns for 7 millimeter optical zone. So it is 13, 15, 17, uh, very easy to memorize. Uh, the PTA should be less than 40%. If it is more than 40%, we have to think about other options. Um, this is uh, an example. Um, f uh, I plan to do flap thickness uh, 130. The ablation depth uh, after calculation is 110. The central corneal thickness is 540. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, PTA is above 40% in spite of good residual stromal bed, 300 microns. In this case, I will not go for uh, LASIK. Uh, or I should reduce flap thickness, and with 120, it is still above 40. When 110, it is still above 40. I have to use the 100, but you have to put in mind the uh, thinner the flap, the more complications of flap uh, you will face. Uh, finally, I uh, take into consideration, or I do, pupil offset, what is called pupil offset in when I want to uh, treat any hyperopic component, either hyperopia uh, or hyperopic astigmatism or mixed astigmatism, uh, and when I have myopic astigmatism more than minus two uh, diopters. Why I should do this? Because in these cases, I need to um, center the profile, the laser profile with the visual axis. Because if you leave the machine walk, uh, it will uh, um, centralize the profile of laser centered with the pupil center, not with the visual axis. So you have to uh, shift the laser profile um, to be centered with the visual axis in order to avoid uh, post-operative uh, high-order abrasions, especially coma. Now, uh, to, to do this, we have to know uh, what is the angle kappa, and then we have to uh, decenter uh, the uh, ablation profile, and we have to decenter the flap, creation of the flap. <coughs> you know, you all know that, uh, what is angle kappa, and it is measured uh, usually by placido. But if I have pentacam I, I, and I don't have placido, very roughly I can say angle kappa is 50% of y and x coordinates of the pupil center. Then I enter the values in order to shift. As you see here, this is when I leave it without shifting, and this is after shifting. Uh, in this case, I am uh, centering 
the uh, ablation profile with the visual axis. <coughs> As you see, I'm centralizing the uh, ablation pro profile with the visual axis, but I have to uh, decenter also the flap. Why? Because if I create the flap um, as usual, in this case, part, and uh, I do offset for the ablation profile, in this case, part of the ablation profile will fall on the hinge, inner hinge of the inner face of the hinge of the flap, and some part of it will fall as well out of the bed. This will uh, cause uh, irregularity in the flap. Uh, this will cause irregularity in ablation. Uh, this will, uh, uh, let us say, uh, uh, expose the patient to epithelial ingrowth uh, complication. So I have to decenter the flap. How I decenter the flap? Um, when the patient is under the machine, I ask him to look at the blinking uh, spot and I put a marker on his perkinge of the blinking spot on his cornea and then when I create the flap I centralize the flap with this point. So again this is the checklist refractive error mesopic pupil K readings percent tissue altered and pupil offset. I'll show you some examples suppose a patient has minus uh, four uh, diopters uh, then I consider surface ablation or lamellar or let us say keratorefractive procedures uh, for the PRK, the uh, central thickness should be more than 470. The final corneal thickness, including the epithelium, should be more than 400. And I should never go um, or start with an optical zone less than 6 millimeter. So the mesopic pupil is 5.7. I will add 0 0.5. So the patient has, a, uh, I will do an optical zone 6.2. The ablation depth will be 56. And the final corneal thickness is 464, including the epithelium. So I am on the safe side. For LASIK, uh, the central thickness should be more than 500. Optical zone should be more than 6 millimeter. And the PTA should be less than 40%. Now, for 6.2 optical zone, the ablation depth is 55, and for a flap thickness 130, the PTA is very good. But I have to study the effect of this ablation on uh, the flat K because it is myopia. Uh, the minus 4 will um, uh, convert the 45 diopters of flat K into 41.8, which is above 34, so I am still on the safe side. So I can do either PRK or LASIK with flap thickness of 130. Another uh, case, minus six diopters sphere, minus two cylinder at 180, so I have these three options. Let us start with the PRK for 5.25. If I add 0 0.5, I will find, um, I will use uh, optical zone 575, but, but this is uh, incorrect. I have to start with six millimeter at least. Now why? Uh, actually, uh, when we have high uh, refractive errors, there is something called the efficient optical zone. The optical zone that you put into the machine is called the optical zone, but the optical, the real optical zone that you find it after three months on the topography uh, of this patient is called efficient optical zone. When you treat high or uh, high uh, refractive errors and you input uh, six millimeter into the machine, you will measure the efficient optical zone after three months, you will find it uh, 525, 550. So it is smaller than the real optical zone. So you shouldn't go beyond six millimeter, otherwise the patient will have a small island and you will need topography guided treatment later. Uh, the ablation depth for this patient will be 105 and the final corneal thickness uh, is 445. Uh, for LASIK, uh, for six millimeter, the ablation is one, uh, two, uh, 102, and uh, for a flap thickness of 100, uh, the um, PTA is less than 40, and even if I increase the thickness of the flap, uh, which is better than using thin flaps, it, it will stay uh, less than 40%. So uh, I can do PRK and LASIK from this point of view, but I have to see what is the effect on K readings. Uh, the flat K will be affected by minus six ablation and uh, the final uh, uh, K1 will be 36.2, which is more than 34. And uh, the, the minus two, of course, will, uh, will not affect the flat K because the minus two cylinder uh, eliminates the difference between K1 and K2. 
So uh, I don't consider it in this ablation, uh, in this, um, uh, on, on K1, I mean. Now, because the patient has minus two diopters of cylinder, I have to use the uh, pupil offset. I need to do pupil offset to avoid post-operative high-order aberrations, especially coma. Um, I have to decenter the, uh, the, the ablation profile and don't forget to decenter the flap. Uh, for fake IOL, the patient has uh, 2.91 internal anterior chamber depth. Be, pay attention to the uh, Pentacam or the other machines when they uh, measure the anterior chamber depth. Sometimes they add the corneal thickness to it, so you may find it uh, high. So uh, be careful, it should be internal. Now for me, I don't do uh, fake IOLs when the uh, anterior chamber depth is less than three millimeters. So we have only two options for the patient, PRK or LASIK, but the flap thickness should not be thicker than 110, and we have to do pupil offset adjustment either in PRK or in LASIK. Uh, th this is the final case uh, as an example, minus six diopters, uh, so I'm in the same category for PRK, uh, six millimeter optical zone, uh, of course, uh, the mesopic pupil is five. I, I don't do 5.5, I have to start from six, uh, and the ablation depth is 80, uh, and the final cor corneal thickness is 460. So I can do it from this point, point of view. Uh, for LASIK, uh, six millimeter, 78 ablation depth. The PTA is uh, one, for 130, uh, flap thickness is uh, borderline, it is 39. Uh, I can uh, reduce in order to be on the safe side, and by this, I can increase also the um, uh, optical zone uh, by to 6.3 if I reduce the flap thickness. However, don't forget that with thin flaps, you have more complications. Um, now, I need to study the effect of this minus six on the uh, flat K. Unfortunately, on flat K, uh, this will reduce the flat K to be 33.2, which is beyond 34. So as you see, for the ablation depth for LASIK and PRK, it is okay, but regarding the K readings, it is not okay. Uh, coming to the uh, fake IOL, unfortunately, it is 2.74, so I have no choice for the patient, but I have the final choice, which is the uh, clear lens extraction, but I look at the age of the patient, the age is 25, so I don't do. Uh, uh, we, we have to uh, know that um, uh, I cannot give solution for every case. This is why the message from this case, that uh, I cannot give a solution for every patient. I have to follow rules. Uh, again, uh, just a reminder, I do um, measure the refractive error, mesopic pupil, K readings, PTA, pupil offset, and thank you very much. The title of this topic is The Limits of LASIK, and I want to emphasize before we even start, it's, it's about the limits. So it's not what's the regular, but it's what's out at the limit. So the things I'm going to look at in, in big detail is refractive error, and then a little bit about the cometry curvature and pupil size. So, so this is in 2010, I think. I presented this paper at the um, American Academy, and in fact, it won the prize for the best paper. So at this point, I was not doing fake um, IOLs. I was doing the artisan, but not the, the star. And once the little star came with the hole in the middle, the VC4, then I started using that more. But I did a paper looking at LASIK compared to surface ablation between minus 8 and minus 12. And as I said, it won the best, it was a poster, best poster. So in this study, we had 403 eyes treated for high myopia, more than minus 8, with the Allegretto. We looked at uncorrected acuity, best corrected acuity, safety, stability, predictability, and compared between these two treatments. And there were 259 LASIK eyes, and there were 89 advanced surface ablation eyes. And the comparison was made at six months. It was retrospective, looking at retrospective data. So when you looked at the, the two groups, they were very similar. Average myopia minus 10.03, <coughs> minus 9.83, and the range exactly the same. So these are patients where today we'd say, well, you know what, maybe there are better options. All right, so what we found on uncorrected vision is that we had around 50% seeing 20-20, which again sounds quite low compared to the results we typically see in refractive surgery. Best corrected acuity was quite different. We had around about 90% of patients seeing 20-25. 
But this is the most important slide with any refractive procedure, is what was the safety? Now, if you go and look at your lasers, and no matter how good your laser is or how modern it is, you're going to have some patients who lose some lines, and you're going to have some patients who gain lines. And if you look at the normal range of myopia, minus three, minus four, we're normally losing about six or seven percent lose one line. With these very highly myopic cases, we're looking at six months around about 10 percent. If you look at the number of patients who gain lines with a standard ablation treatment, it's normally 16 percent to 20 percent. With high myopia, at six months we're approaching 30 percent. So this whole idea that you can't do LASIK for high myopia is not 100 percent true. In fact, you get a much, much greater percentage of patients gaining lines re relative to patients losing lines. And the main reason for that is because of magnification. So you know when you see someone who's very myopic, you can see on their glasses that it minifies the, their face behind the glasses. And in the same way, whatever they're looking at is minified. The moment you bring the correction onto the cornea, you get magnification. So a big part of why people do better with whatever procedure we do for myopia is the magnification issue. Stability in, um, was pretty good with both procedures. And astigmatic control was very good. And um, the predictability was very good. So the conclusion of this, this poster was that between LASIK and LASIK, or advanced surface ablation, for high myopia, there wasn't a very big difference. Stability was slightly better with LASIK. Um, both procedures gave more gained lines than lost lines. Both are very safe. 0.5% lost more than two lines. I'll remind you that for the FDA, a procedure is unsafe when more than 5% lose more than two lines. It's a very, very safe procedure. You see the number of patients losing a line, and more than 30% gain lines in each group. This was doing wavefront optimized treatments. Subsequent to this, we did the ray tracing study, and with ray tracing, the accuracy of high myopia was at 90%. So I'm not a, I don't, agree with the group who say LASIK over minus eight has no place. I think it has place frequently. All right, this is a, a very different topic, hyperopic LASIK, what are the limits over here? So I think just in general, a few, a few things. How fast can your car go? Well, it depends on what car you have. Um, and it depends on how well you can drive. Those two things determine how fast you can go. So hyperopia is a little bit the same. How high can we go? Well, it depends on your laser. It makes a very big difference. All of us know we've had different lasers. Some do better than others with high hyperopia. As we heard from Professor Sinjab, it depends on preoperative keratometry, your projected post-op keratometry, and some other factors as well. So it's widely accepted that the highest we should go is maybe 50 diopters in terms of corneal steepness. Some would say if the eye you're treating is the reading eye, you might go even slightly steeper, 51 or 52. Um, some would say 48. So there's no real value that's been shown very well um, what the limits are. But most people are going to say don't go above 50. But it ultimately depends on your experience and your laser. So Marsden showed this a moment ago. Just bear in mind when you calculate the projection that for every one diopter of hyperopia, the cornea steepens by 1.2, and for myopia, it's, it flattens by 0 0.8. I might just mention, uh, in fact, I'll get there later. So I'm going to show you an example. A two diopter treatment is going to induce 2.4 diopters of steepening. Pre-op K is 49. Projected post-op K is 51. Rather don't do it, even though the patient's only plus two. Look at a patient like this who's plus five. This is going to induce six diopters of steepening. Pre-op is for 41. You can end up at 47. You know what? You can do this. If this is the only option for this patient, you can do it. It's informed consent. One of the biggest issues with hyperopic treatments when you start becoming steeper is what happens to the epithelium. So we all know from keratoconus that the epithelium thins over the cone and thickens in the, the paracentral area or the paraconal area. And Dan Reinstein has done most of the work that explains this to us. So we know about this thing called apical syndrome. But there's an additional thing which Dan has subsequently published recently, about a month ago, I should have updated this, um, but at ESCRS a few years ago, he showed a condition that he, he didn't know what to call. But he has three cases like this now. But interestingly, only one of them had a steep post-op K. And it wasn't even that steep. It was 49 point something. But two of these patients were at 43. And they had a condition where because the cornea was steeper over there and the cornea simply couldn't support this amount of steepness, 
the epithelium fluctuated. So during the night, the epithelium would flatten and the patient would wake up a lot more hyperopic. And then during the day, as the epithelium thickens, the patient would become more myopic again. And we were, he's got very, very good evidence showing how the topography fluctuates with the refraction. Um, but interestingly, two of the three cases he's published did not have high Ks afterwards. So how high can we go with a wave light laser? Well, I'll show you what my nomogram says. We can do up to plus six on the laser, and I've got data for plus one to plus two, for plus two to plus three, for plus three to plus four, plus four to, pl let me stop here for a moment, plus five to plus six. So what you see at the bottom is, is my nomogram. So if I want to correct plus five, I need to enter plus 473 on my laser. What you see above is the global nomogram. So you can always, if you're doing a procedure that's on the limits of what you typically do, if your um, outcomes analysis program doesn't include it, you can look at what happens globally. And when we get to plus six to plus seven, we have no data because we don't use it above that on our laser. What I decided to do, um, before I get to what the company suggests, is I decided to see how do our results of LASIK for hyperopia compare to clear lens extraction. And you'll be interested to know there's not a single paper in the literature that does that, that comp compares refractive lens exchange to LASIK for any refractive error. There's nothing. And the number of publications in the literature on refractive lens exchange is unbelievably low. There's very little about it. And most of what we know is what people say, anecdotal. So I thought, let me go and see what the results look like. So in this column, you'll see the results of LASIK. In this column, you'll see the, the results of IOL surgery. And this included cataract surgery, early cataracts, as well as refractive lens exchange. And between plus one and plus three, you can see from manifest sphere equivalent, there's not a big difference. Plus three to plus four, tighter with LASIK, but more of a wider spread, but the mean is pretty similar. Plus four to plus five, LASIK more predictable than refractive lens exchange. And plus five to plus six, the same thing. Yes, we'll be ending on average with LASIK. Yes, we'll be ending on average with refractive lens exchange. Remember, for these short eyes, our formulas aren't wonderful. And no matter how we adjust them, exactly where that lens is going to land, we're not sure of. Look at uncorrected acuity. The mean pretty similar, but actually better in LASIK for the lower myopes, uncorrected. Again, same thing for three to four, four to five, and five to six. All right, as we said earlier, the most important thing normally is safety. So what's happening with safety is how many patients are gaining a line versus how many are losing. With LASIK, we know many, well, not with LASIK, with hyperopic corrections, we know that patients lose more lines than they do with myopia. And again, the main reason is minification. If you're making this image smaller, whether it's due to the cornea changing shape or due to the lens power inside the eye, it's the same effect on the retina. And so now when we compared them, one thing you will see in terms of safety is that more lines are gained with IOLs than are with um, the curator refractive procedures. No matter what range you go through. So, I was very, very, very pleased to see this. And if all of us who do refractive surgery for hyperopes will know the term 20 over happy. And we see these patients where we think, well, the vision's not that wonderful. It might be 675, but the patient's really happy. And there are many reasons. One of them is that the uncorrected distance improves, but clear, or, or crucially, the intermediate improves as does the near, and also the visual field expands. So there's a whole lot more to vision than just the acuity. So most hyperopic patients are pretty happy. All right, what do the laser manufacturers advise? I spoke to Wavelight, Zeiss, Technola, Schwind, Physics. I couldn't get anything from Nidec, Allah. So what I might ask you to do, Allah, I might ask you just to give your opinion once we get through what the others have said about Nidec's recommendations. But let me show you what the companies say. So there's a lot of information. I want you to read just what the red line says. Wavelight approved to treat hyperopia up to plus six. And looking at a number of factors, all these factors combined suggest we should stay within the sixth optical limit. So that's, a, that's what we tend to do. If you look at the Zeiss laser, the Zeiss laser is approved to plus three. Yet most of what we know about epithelium and the effect of epithelium after hyperopic LASIK comes from Dan Reinstein. 
Bernd Reinstein, on a regular basis, he has 500 cases of, hyper, of hyperopic LASIK over plus six. Um, but he does it using epithelium to tell him how far he can go. So when he plans a treatment, he plans a treatment um, telling the patient we're going to correct most of your error. If the patient decides this is their best choice, they don't want a refractive lens exchange, we're going to correct most of your error that I think I can do very safely. Post-operatively, we're going to look at your epithelial map. If the epithelium is still uniform everywhere, we know this cornea can, can um, support this epithelium, we can go another diopter steeper. If the epithelium is starting to thin centrally, we won't go any further. So the MEL90 technically allows you to treat up to up plus eight in a cylinder of six, but obviously you need to apply caution at this range. Technolas, this I got uh, from a user as well, I treated patients with flat corneas up to plus seven, but have avoided treating patients no matter what their number if you're going to make them too steep. The company said um, something to bear in mind is that it's important to look at what other people around you are doing too. It's interesting, I'm an expert at the moment on a medico legal case, something in this same space, and the new rules in the UK and Ireland anyway are no longer what everybody would do, but rather are there sufficient people, just the responsible group. So in our group of 200 people here, if there were five people saying, yeah, I do LASIK up to plus seven regularly, I get good results, that's a responsible body. All you need to do is show that other people are doing the same thing. You're not the only one doing it. And the technolas also says the most astigmatism you can treat in the liberal group is plus three, and um, no one will really treat more than 6.5. So again, much the same number. Schwint have thought this through very well. They labor the Amaris allows you to treat up to plus six, plus five in PRK, but again, off-label, up to plus eight. And they've, sorry, I wanted to, uh, what they've looked at is a number of factors to determine how high you can go. And their, their limit, theoretically, is at plus seven. But it's not a commitment, it's something you can look at personally. And some of the things they're looking at are epithelium, like Dan Reinstein does. They're also looking at something, I hope I have it over here, this is an important point. So if you look at the average K in the population, and you then go standard deviations, two standard deviations, so 95% of the population are within this range, you get up to 47.2. So people with a preoperative K of 47.2 are pretty normal, they're within 95% of people. If you add one further standard deviation, you get to 49.2. So that means there are people walking around with corners of 49.2 with very good vision, very comfortably. So in their minds, they think we can also go to 49.2 pretty easily. Karina Rocha, looking at adaptive optics, has seen how much spherical aberration you can, in, you can tolerate. And again, the amount you can tolerate is, is around about 0 0.6, and that allows you to do a plus 7 correction for hyperopia. The Visex device, um, it's approved up to plus 6, although well, most users um, would limit it to plus 5 at most, and in fact, most users don't go more than, than plus 3.5. It's very important to know that other alternatives besides glasses and contact lenses, um, but LASIK has a role, especially when you really apply um, diligence to it. And then obviously for these patients, there are many times we say the best thing to do is nothing for now and wait until you're older and do a, a refractive lens exchange. So refractive lens exchange has this additional um, benefit, I spoke about it yesterday, where you also decongest shallow anterior chambers. This is the paper for those that like to look at it. But basically, if a chamber depth is less than 2.1, the volume is less than 100, the angle is less than 26, you're running a risk of angle closure. You have to do something in the next 12 months, either a PI or a lens exchange. So phakic IOLs for this particular group, high hyperopes, are not very common because of the anterior chamber dimensions. Um, sometimes they are possible, but you have to be careful too. Eyes that are very hyperopic and have an adequate anterior chamber depth often have other issues with, with glaucoma. So how high can we go? Well, manufacturers have an opinion, colleagues have an opinion, some experts have pushed the envelope further, and every procedure we do has its own set of risks and benefits, and it's something you need to discuss with your patient. So for hyper, high hyperopia, this is ultimately a situation for informed consent, and you have to discuss the risks and benefits of LASIK for hyperopia versus the alternatives. Pachymetry, the preoperative requirement for LASIK is 480, um, it used to be 500. The ESCRS two years ago or three years ago reduced it to, five, uh, to 480. Flap thickness, um, 25 micron standard deviation with microkeratomes typically, although some of the disposals are much less now. 
are less than 10. Femto is around about 7. So that means if you have a 7 micron deviation, 95% of flaps will be within 14 microns of what you planned. So you plan 120, 95% will be between 106 and 134. If you look at this with a, a microkeratome, micro the, um, not the disposables, your flap might vary um, between 90 and 170. And that's quite important when you're making your, your plans. Residual corneal thickness, um, EOCRS suggests more than 250. As we've spoken about before, there's no real evidence. This again is anecdotal. It's been what's happened through storytelling. Um, most surgeons that are targeting more than 380, and personally myself and many people I know want more than 300 in the bed. The ablation depth, you need to work off 15.7 microns per diopter when you're calculating this. And it's irrespective of which laser performs it. What's important to know is that when we do nomogram adjustments, say for argument's sake you're doing a minus 10, so in your head you know that's 157 microns, your nomogram might suggest you need to key in minus 9, and the laser tells you minus 9 is 135 microns. You have to bear in mind, to get the effect of minus 10, it has to remove the 157. The nomogram adjustment is just what you've got to do in order to get what you intended to get. So it's still going to take away whatever you're treating times 15.7. And curvature, we have spoken about in terms of hyperopia and myopia. And the last thing I'm going to speak about is pupil size, just in general. Pupil size generally for optimized ablations at 6.5 is not important. There's enough in the literature now showing that on a good ablation profile, if you do a large optical zone, even if the pupil is significantly larger, even in a patient with aniridia, you're not going to have issues due to the Stiles Crawford effect. For hyperopia, this is important, even more important, because of the, the cone you're creating. And uh, there was another point I wanted to make, I've just forgotten for a second. I want to make one last point in terms of the projected Ks. There's a lot been said over the years about projected Ks not being steeper than 50, 48, 50 for hyperopia. A lot also gets said about not going lower than 37, 35, 32. I've spoken to a number of people, Professor Seiler, in, Seiler included, who says there is no lower limit for myopia, nothing. And in our ray tracing study, we had one patient of minus 11, who the final K was 29 diopters, she landed up at 6.5. So he says if you've got an optical system, and if you're flattening the optical system in front, not steepening it, if you're flattening it, all you're doing is creating a lens in front that matches the optics of the eye, and he says there's no limit to, to going low. So thank you very much for your attention. And, no. Um, I've made this a whole lot shorter than what it was. I, I wasn't aware when I saw these, oh, how do I get in here? these courses that the courses were actually in some of them in a the large room. So some of this is unfortunately repetition from what was done the other day. Uh, I thought this was a small course in a, in a small room for people who'd been be moving around. So basically, a clear lens exchange with premium ILs. The premium ILs are toric correcting ILs and presbyopia correcting ILs. And one of the benefits of refractive lens exchange is we have a much wider range than corneal refractive. We, we start debating at minus 8 and minus 10. You don't have to with lens exchanges. Um, or plus 10. You don't, you don't consider with, with LASIK, and it's a very, good, um, a very good option over here. One of the issues, though, is the premium lenses often don't have the same range as the monofocal lenses. Um, laser can correct an exact magnitude. If you're doing topo guided or custom Q, you can target using your nomogram to 0.01 um, and you can put the axis exactly where you want to and thanks to trackers it's going to be on axis. IOLs come typically in 0.75 to up the increments and the way that you achieve a refractive target is by the manufacturer and their calculator doing a vector analysis and telling you this is the lens to use and place it at this particular axis. But they're doing a vector analysis to give you the best final outcome. And then we know what all the challenges are with, with getting the lens on target. So in topography, you need to look at a number of things. What is the corneal astigmatism? So when you're doing a, a, a refractive procedure on the lens, you're going to unmask what's happening in the cornea. We have a number of patients who are basically um, no cylinder refractively, but have two diopters of corneal astigmatism. So you now know they've got two diopters of lenticular astigmatism. When you remove the lens and put a standard lens in, you're going to unmask the corneal astigmatism. Angle cap is important, especially with um, multifocal lenses. And corneal regularity is very important, again, especially with multifocal lenses. 
So corneal astigmatism, you need to know the magnitude, the axis, and whether it's regular or not. If someone has, if someone's an equally good candidate, um, just from the medical point of view, for a lens procedure versus a, a laser procedure, and the astigmatism is, is regular, well then really it's up to the patient considering all the, the risks and benefits. But many cases of astigmatism are quite irregular, and you can do way better than with the laser refractive procedure, correcting, topo topographically correcting the irregular astigmatism. Pupil size and multifocals. I've been victim to this myself, sometimes putting a multifocal in for a patient where the pupil just isn't mobile enough, and the lens then behaves a lot more like a monofocal, and they don't get the effect of the, of the other rings. So the pupil needs to be mobile, it needs to be able to dilate. So intraocular solutions come down to the same issues. We've got to speak to what does the patient need, what is the defocus curve, and how can we customize this further. So laser refractive surgery has got to the point where we can do a lot of customization to improve things. So this is the defocus curve of a number of different lenses, and you can see how they differ, where they're good for distance, where they're good for near, what are they doing for intermediate. This is the um, plus four restore and the plus three restore, and again you can see where they're good for near, the plus four not particularly good for intermediate, the plus three better, the plus two and a half even better. So I'm going to show you something, I touched on this the other day on the Presby OP session for those of you who were there. But for me, this is really exciting, where lens technology is now going to sort of where we are with laser. And I think the future is going to show that there are things we can do that help us to make better decisions. So one of them is something that Michael Marachan has started. It's a company called, it's currently called Custom RX, the prototypes, but the company is going to be called Vivior. And it's based on giving a patient a pair of glasses. Someone who doesn't wear glasses is an emetrope. We see more and more patients in our practice who are emetropic, who are 50 years old, who want a solution for near. So you try to figure out what the best solution is. If someone wears glasses, well then they wear their glasses and you simply add this little device to the frame. And what this device does is it measures, you can tell the device what you're doing at the moment and it'll measure what distance you're working at. You can just keep the device on and it'll measure your distribution of, of use, your through focus curve through a day. It measures things like the ambient light. It even measures, measures things like what your head position is. Um, so if you think about all the sophistication we have in our, in our, our treatments, we're actually quite unsophisticated in the way we make the decision about what to do. We have a short discussion, what do you want from this, and you go ahead and do it. So I think what they're trying to provide us with is some, some more objective, innovative data to tell us what the patient wants. So individual lifestyles, people have individual needs. And whichever one way we go, we can customize this further. So the device is going to be a pair of glasses. And currently in the prototype, it's attached to a smartphone. Um, but for the market, it's going to be attached to a, a wearable wa watch. And so the patient will get this device from the practitioner, you put it on, they spend the day with it, or um, even less time. And it's got sensors looking at distance, ambient light, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, a magnometer, connections via a smooth uh, Bluetooth, and the user interface allows you to tell the device exactly what you're doing. And at the end of the day, you get this sort of information. Where's this patient spending their time? where the circles are bigger is where there's more frequent occurrence and the time spent in a different zone has more color. So more color, more time. So it gives you a very, very good idea of where you are. And it shows you also what your distribution of working distances is. And so you can go and look at specific, for, for specific tasks, what the range is that you prefer to work at and how, how much time you're spending in each of those zones and what the ambient light is. So I'm going to give you one example where this was really useful. I told someone the story last night. They had a patient who said she was in her 70s, and she said she just watches TV. She doesn't do anything more. And they said, don't you read? And she said, no, I don't read. Don't enjoy reading. I watch TV. And so anyone would have thought for this patient, your option is the monofocal distance lens. When they pushed this device on her, they found that she spent an awful lot of time when she was watching TV, it was marked as watching TV, doing something at this distance. And they asked her when they saw this, and they said, you weren't watching TV last night. And she said, I was. What were you watching? And she told them the program she was watching. 
And they said, but you, you were always over here. I think you were on your phone. She says, yes, I play Sudoku all the time. They said, but they said you were watching TV. She said, well, I listen to the TV. So that just shows you the miscommunication we get. So this is a device that's going to have the ability to give us a much better idea of what the patient's defocus requirements are. And then you can look at the options you offer, look at their defocus curves, and help them match. And it becomes an easy decision which one makes the most sense. If you get to a point where you decide your best option is a, you've got, you've got a decision, you have the, the couple in mind, Susanna Marcus's Simvis device then allows you to place within this device that optic. So you now have this device on, and say you've decided your best options are camera in one eye and a multifocal IL. That's your two options. And the two or three IOLs you're thinking about. You can have each one of those in the device. Patient puts, wears the device, puts it on, doesn't know which one's which, flicks through them, and gets to a point which says, I like this one the most. And you have a look and see which one it is. And you have a much, much better um, idea of what the patient requires. So I think um, it's a very exciting space at the moment. Our technology for treatments getting better and better. I think our ability to make good decisions in terms of what the best options are getting better too. So it's a nice place to be. It's a nice time to be an ophthalmologist. So thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. This is my, my last talk in this meeting and I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the uh, organizing uh, committee, especially Dr. Saeed Al Ghamdi and, and his team, for this wonderful, very successful uh, meeting for the third year uh, in a row. Uh, I know how much effort had been done behind the scenes to make this uh, uh, meeting a, such a great success. Uh, in the coming uh, 20 minutes, I'm going to uh, address a very interesting subject, at least to me. Uh, because I've been very interested in thickic intraocular lenses more than 25 years ago. Uh, and uh, when you start talking about 25 years experience, that's when you start to feel really old. Uh, uh, I remember in 1993, and you had this discussion yesterday with, with Arthur, uh, when I was doing my fellowship under the late uh, George Waring III, at that time, we were just starting doing LASIK, 1993, 92, 93, LASIK with a flap, uh, the way we are doing LASIK today, more or less. And I was telling George, uh, you know, I'm very happy that we are here in the Middle East doing LASIK in 1992, and our colleagues in Europe, they don't even think of doing that, just do PRK, and our friends in the, in the USA are still doing RKs, and uh, PRKs, and, and, and uh, they think the, so we are doing the future. He told me, Allah, you're wrong. LASIK is not the future. LASIK is the present that was in the mid-90s. The future is fake intraocular lenses. And I think he was right. When two, three decades later now, I can tell you that he was right. Uh, and I think that if the fake intraocular lenses uh, the, way, the way it is today was present uh, in, 19, in the early 90s with the, with the introduction of the eczema lasers. I don't think that the LASIK and the eczema laser technology would make it such a strong impact on refractive surgery. Uh, the problem is patients tell you, doctor, you're going to open my eye and put a foreign body inside the eye, like the other doctor told me. I told him, no. If you want to do LASIK, okay, I'm going to slice your cornea in two pieces, remove the, uh, lift the upper third, and then burn your tissue with the eczema laser. So it's the it's it's it, it's mindset. Uh, 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 if you if you think if the if our patients think that thickic intraocular lens is a major surgery, that's because we surgeons still do not uh, uh, are not yet convinced that this is the best way to go. Uh, in this, uh, here are my, my financial disclosures. I'm, 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 I'm uh, uh, consulting for Star Surgical, who are manufacturing the ICL, and uh, NIDEC, uh, who are manufacturing the eczema laser. Now, if you want to uh, put some criteria for if an ideal FECIC intraocular lenses, what will be the FECIC IOL that you want to have in your eye, or in, your, in the eye of your loved ones? I would say I, would, I want to have a FECIC IOL which is very predictable, 
correcting the full range of myopia and astigmatism. I want a FICIC IOL that is maintaining the quality of vision, at least maintaining the quality of vision, uh, that is stable inside my eye, uh, to have a biocompatible material with no damage to ocular structure on the long term. Uh, I want a lens that gives me a very fast recovery. Today we're not in the era of large incisions, suturings, and removing of suturing three weeks later. And I want a lens that is easy to be removed because we know that the majority of the lenses that we are putting today are going to get removed 30 years down the road when these patients develop uh, uh, age-related cataract because they are mostly myopes and high myopes. So m the majority of these lenses are going to be removed. So you have to have this end in mind when you put the FECIC intraocular lens today. Now let's talk about the efficacy and predictability. FECIC intraocular lenses enjoy a very wide range of correction, including the astigmatism. Any FECIC intraocular lens that does not correct astigmatism, that, that does not have a toric design, is of no good in our practice. Today, after, you know, we had many FECIC lenses in the market for a long time ago, today uh, we have only two uh, designs that really made it. The uh, ICL, which is the posterior chamber lens, and the iris fixated lens, which is the Artiflex. This is the modern uh, uh, model of the, of the artisan lens. The power limitation uh, for the ICL, you, you can correct from plus 10 to minus 20 diopters. W very wide range, much wider than you can do with any eczema laser. You can <coughs> correct uh, astigmatism up to six diopters with the toric design. With the uh, Artisan, which is a PMMA lens, the, 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 the range is even wider. You can go up to 24 diopters of myopia. With the Artiflex, which is a foldable lens, the range is smaller. So this is the most common limitation for the Artiflex because you cannot go beyond 13.5. It was 12 until a few years ago. Now it's 13.5. But in ev all of these lenses has a toric design which can correct the myopia. Uh, now, for the predictability, FECIC lenses are very predictable. Any kind, even the lenses that were withdrawn from the market were very predictable. And that was actually bad for these lenses because patients are happy for the on the first day, first year, second year, and then five years down the road, they start to develop complications. So the predictability is definitely better than any eczema laser correction. We published this many years ago, uh, 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 2002. And we showed that the predictability with FECIC lenses is much better than predictability with LASIK. Now, when I looked back to uh, FECIC lenses that I uh, implanted over a year, 800, uh, more than 800 cases, and I looked at the preoperative astigmatism, uh, I wanted to know how much, how many of these lenses were toric and, and, uh, and uh, how many were spheric. So I found that if you have a patient who has two diopters or more, then you need to do a toric lens. No question about this. If you have a patient with a cylinder that is less than one, you can do a spheric lens. No uh, doubt about this. But if the, the gray zone is between one and two. And this is, I would say, 20% of my cases, even more, 26% of my cases had cylinder of one and two. So the question is, would you go toric or just do spherical equivalent? The answer is very clear in my mind because I compared these two groups patients with low cylinder between one and two who have a toric phacic intraocular lens are much happier than patients with uh, a spherical lens. Well, if you put a spherical lens, the patient will be happy, but he doesn't know what he's missing. This is, this is the problem, this is the issue here. So you, as a physician, you need to give your patient the best uh, result, which is corrected astigmatism, even if it's in the range of one or two diopters. We did the vector analysis for these patients and we we uh, and a, a subjective questionnaire at the end of the th third month and we definitely had a very clear answer to this question that patients with toric lenses are happier. Now if you look at the quality of vision, uh, fecic lenses have a uh, uh, advantage that they do not induce any high order spherical aberrations. Uh, compared to eczema laser and keratorefractive surgery, it's a big difference. Uh, 
I remember the old days of, of LASIK, when we, that was in the early uh, mid-90s, when uh, we were trying to see if the transition zone is important or not. That was in the, in the uh, moyenage of the, of the uh, of dark ages of, of refractive surgery. And we found that uh, the fecal lenses gives a larger effective optical zone rather than uh, uh, we're talking about functional optical zone. If you have an, a fake lens, you have a large functional optical zone, even if it's the same diameter of the laser ablation. So for a six millimeter fake lens, you will have a, um, I'm sorry. You will have a larger uh, optical zone than uh, a fake intraocular, than, than a laser uh, uh, correction. Uh, I, am, I, I always look at the uh, objective assessment of the quality of vision and I use very heavily the, the, the uh, MTF, the modulation transfer function, because I think this is the best way to assess the objective uh, quality, objectively the quality of vision. It does not measure scatter because the aberrometers cannot measure scatter, so for scatter we go to the, uh, uh, the OSI, the objective scatter index, as Dr. Madden mentioned earlier. See this patient, an eye who had a toric intraocular lens. You see, before the surgery, the high order MTF is good enough. And after the surgery, it did not change. All what we did is that we moved the low order MTF to be almost coincident with the high order uh, uh, MTF. So this patient enjoys exactly the same quality of vision uh, as he had before the surgery. And for these young patients who have excellent optics, you all what you want to do is not to induce harm, not to induce uh, high order aberrations. Uh, the functional optical zone, when we compared posterior chamber lenses with anterior chamber lenses, we found that the posterior chamber lenses, because they are closer to the nodal point, they give you a larger functional optical zone and that's uh, definitely better. The limitation of fake intraocular lenses here is those patients who have poor quality of vision then you need to keep in mind that a fake lens will never improve the quality of vision. So patients with stable keratoconus with good visual equity are always a good candidate for fake intraocular lenses. However, you, you have to be aware that the patients will not have a better visual uh, quality than before the surgery. Uh, I hope one day in the future we'll have customized, we can have customized fake lenses that can address the uh, uh, aberrations uh, and improve the quality uh, vision, of vision of those patients. Now, stability. You don't want to have a, a, a moving object in the eye, whether in the anterior or the posterior chamber. And that's why some lenses did not actually make it because they are rotating inside the eye, like this uh, uh, angle fixated anterior chamber lens that was moving inside the eye uh, uh, over years. For the two available lenses, uh, the uh, ICL and the Artisan, especially with the toric design, I use the OPD scan to assess the stability of the toric lens inside the eye. And this is the OPD, the, uh, the internal OPD before the surgery, and then three months after the surgery, six months and one year, and I keep doing this every year. And I can tell you that a toric ICL does not rotate inside the eye unless it's undersized. So if you have the right sizing, then you will not have rotations. Uh, I have like 3% of axis misalignment. Most of them are due to wrong uh, 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 axis implantation during the surgery. And this was more common in the older design when you have to do peripheral aridectomy, so you constrict the pupil. If the pupil gets smaller during the surgery, then you cannot really see well the axis. This is an example of a patient who had a toric ICL, then one week after the surgery, he had vision of 2080 uncorrected, and then it corrects to 2020 with this mixed astigmatism. So we did the OPD scan, the internal OPD, we found that the axis is not aligned. Then we just rotate the lens inside the eye and it went back to almost plano with the 2020 vision. Now, the tip here is if this lens is undersized, it will rotate again. And how to, to know this during the surgery? If, if it's very easy to move the lens inside the eye, then it will rotate again. Then you, you better be prepared 
for a lens exchange. For the artisan lens, the, the, the RH fixated lenses, the good news is that the lens stays where you fix it for the rest of the patient's life, hopefully, because it does not rotate inside the eye. But what might, might happen, and I've seen this in, 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 in quite a good number of patients, if you have a poor enclavation, then this lens may dislocate inside the eye, like in these cases, and this is a very serious condition, you need to remove the lens immediately and either reposition it or exchange it. Uh, also over, you know, when, when you start seeing your 20 years old patients, you start to see these cases with iris piercing. Lens was perfectly uh, 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 in the right position for 10, 15 years, and then the haptic mechanism, the claw, pierces the iris from the iris from the uh, pressure atrophy over the years, and then it goes uh, uh, through the iris, and then the lens starts to sag down. Uh, usually with no much effect on the vision unless it's a toric lens, uh, but there is some movement of the lens inside the eye with uh, rubbing against the iris, maybe some endothelial damage and some, some refractive changes. Now the fourth point of an ideal IOL is biocompatibility. Here we're talking about the material of the lens. The, the, star, the star have the columnar, which is a, 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 an exclusive material to star surgical for so many years with millions of implants in, in, in the eyes with very good long-term safety. That's why any posterior chamber lens that will come in the future will need a very long time to prove uh, uh, biocompatibility and safety. On the other side, the artisan lens is a PMMA lens. PMMA is very well-known material, very biocompatible. The Artiflex lens, which is a silicon lens, silicon optic, and PMMA haptic, the earlier design in the mid, uh, uh, in, in 2004, that's when we introduced the, Arti the, the Artiflex, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, a, a fourth generation silicon that was inducing late inflammation inside the eye. And I've seen many cases with late chronic uveitis, few months after the surgery, this is one of them. But I, what I know now is that they changed the material and they have a better uh, biocompatibility. Uh, now, long-term results for the anterior chamber angle-supported lenses, which do not exist in the market anymore, uh, pupil ovalization with a disastrous uh, 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 long-term uh, effect on the angle because of the tucking of the, of the roots of the iris uh, by the haptics. Now, the most important uh, tissue that you want to preserve in the cornea with trachea lenses is the endothelium. And I never put uh, these lenses, the angle-supported lenses, because from day one, from 1992, when we had George Baikoff here, and he did the, per the first Novita, uh, that was co not called Novita at that time, the 5MZB uh, lenses, we knew that this is not the lens that, you, that we want to use, uh, because anything in the angle is not really welcome. Uh, we had lots of published information on safety of these lenses 10 years down the road, but then 15 and 20 years, we saw the endothelial decompensation and these lenses were withdrawn from the market, started in France and then in other uh, countries. And I've seen this uh, on many patients. Now, what about the artisan lens, which is in common use today? This lens is good, this lens is safe, only if the anterior chamber depth from the endothelium is three millimeter or more. And this is a very critical, anybody is using artisan lens in this room? Very few. On the artisan lens? No, no, I'm talking about the FECIC lenses. The, the, on the website of Oftec, you know, I put thousands of these lenses. On the website of Oftec, it says the inclusion criteria is three millimeter from anterior chamber depth of three millimeter. By definition, anterior chamber depth is measured from the epithelium. So I asked the company to change it and to say anterior chamber depth from the endothelium is, should be three millimeter, but they, they refused. I can tell you that in many patients, including this one of my own patients who had artisan lens 20 years ago with anterior chamber depth deeper than 2.9 or, or 3 millimeter from the endothelium, we have perfect endothelium. We have no 
long-term endothelial loss. But in many patients with anterior chamber depth, less than 2.8 from the endothelium, after 15 or 20 years, the endothelium decompensate. Today, when I see any of my patients who had an artisan lens with three millimeter from the epithelium with a 500 thickness cornea, then it's 2.5 from the endothelium. Even if his endothelium is doing well, I remove the lens today. And this, if you want to take one message from this presentation, that you should not put an artisan lens in a patient with anterior chamber depth that is less than, two, than three millimeter from the endothelium. I've done DZAC on many of these patients. Now, endothelial cell study, how reliable these are, I would say they are not reliable. This is a good example. I did some uh, research on uh, endothelial cell, cell studies after a certain fake lens. And you can see the discrepancy in the, in the literature, ranging from, if you look at the mean, it looks very nice, 8% at 10 years. But if you look at the standard deviation, it's plus minus 16, and the range is minus 50 to plus 34. I don't know somebody, someone who gains 34% of endothelial cells over the years. This tells you how unreliable the endothelial cells uh, uh, studies are over long term. Uh, this is an example of an artisan lens in a shallow anterior chamber, 2.7 from the endothelium, uh, and this makes the anterior surface of the lens very close to uh, the uh, uh, endothelium. Now, posterior chamber lenses are very cl are closest to the crystalline lens. This is higher incidence of cataract, especially with the older designs. The very old designs uh, uh, in the 90s from, from Adatomad, uh, was unfoldable posterior chamber lenses with 20% cataract. We did not use this. We stopped in after one day. The earlier design of the ICL, the, 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 v, uh, the ICL and then v, V1, V2, and V3 had like 10% uh, 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 induced cataract, and I did not use, I stopped using the ICL for, so, for more than 10 years because of this reason. With the V4B, uh, my incidence of cataract was 0.5 percent, which is which is very low. With the V4C that we started using a couple, couple of years ago, I did not see any case of cataract so far. In about thousand eyes, uh, half of them at least finished, uh, completed one year follow up with no cases of cataract so far. And I think that the central hole of the V4C uh, uh, improves the aqueous flow. It doesn't go through the iridectomy, but it goes through the center, which is more physiological. So I think this helps a lot uh, in uh, prevention of, of cataracts. This is an OCT uh, showing a good volt, uh, about 500 microns from the uh, uh, crystalline lens. This is a, a low volt. And remember that low volt per se is not the problem. The problem is to have peripheral touch with the ICL. If, if the ICL is touching the crystallines at the periphery, even if you have a central good volt, then there is some sequestered uh, 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 aqueous with uh, toxic metabolites uh, building up here, and this is the cause of metabolic cataract that you see in the anterior chamber, uh, on the uh, anterior, uh, anterior subcapsular cataract. Remember that a poor surgical technique is the most common cause for cataract with fake intraocular lenses. And this is an example. I've seen this patient who was done somewhere else, an artiflex lens, which is not known to induce cataract. The patient came with a white cataract and fixed dilated pupil only because of a poor uh, surgical technique. Now, fast recovery, uh, I, th I think the, the, the PMMA lenses with a large incision, six millimeter or five meter incision with sutures, they were excellent lenses for the, for the 90s, but today they have, I don't think they have a place in refractive surgery. And remember that if you put this lens today, they will be removed 30 years later. The next generation of ophthalmologists will not know how to do a six millimeter incision or how to close it and how to do uh, 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 suturing for, for, the, for such large incisions. So to, I think today the place is only for foldable lenses. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the majority of these lenses will be removed. So removal is very important. Now, if you remove an ICL, whether because development of uh, uh, age-related cataract 30 years down the road or because of uh, 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 wrong sizing, a very high or very low volt, then this is the best way to remove an ICL, in, at least in my hands. The, the, t the trick is to uh, 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 deliver the lens, the haptic, in the anterior chamber 
and then rotate the lens in a di diagonal position. And if you're using a wound smaller than three millimeter, then enlarge the wound up to three millimeters. Because some surgeons, I, I use 2.8 for the ICL. I know surgeons using 2.6, but if to remove a lens safely, you have you need to have three millimeter. And then the only tip is to hold the lens from the junction of the optic and haptic. This is the thickest part of the lens. It's about 600 micron, and then you just pull it out. It will come so easily. And then you can insert another lens if this is for exchange, uh, 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 or do your FACO if this is a patient who had a, a, a senile cataract 30 years uh, later. So to conclude, the limitation of modern phacic intraocular lenses are the power limitation, especially for the anterior chamber lenses, cannot go more than 13 uh, diopters of myopia. They do not improve the quality of vision because we are using phacic lenses more and more for stable keratoconus, especially after cross-linking. This is my best offer to my keratoconus patients who have good vision. Uh, and good quality of vision or acceptable quality of vision to do cross-linking, wait for a couple of years, and then put a, a phacic intraocular lens. Uh, the sizing issue, with, especially with the ICL, the artisan has no sizing issues, but with the ICL, the sizing issue is the main remaining unanswered uh, uh, qu uh, question. Uh, uh, we're getting better with the sizing, but still, once in a blue moon, you have an oversized lens or undersized lens, but this is getting less and less frequent. The long-term endothelial cell loss for the anterior chamber lenses with AC depth less than three millimeter from the endothelium is the most serious uh, uh, complications. For the hard lenses, the PMMA artisan lenses, slow recovery is definitely a, a limitation. And then the difficulty uh, to remove or exchange uh, later on with the next uh, generation of thermologists will be a big, a big hassle. And I thank you for your kind attention.